Welcome friends to this monthly meeting. I have a little sore throat, so my voice may be a little hoarsey, forgive for that. Uh, I got an email from a friend of mine uh, a few days back. He says he agrees with everything I say, except he does not believe that we do not have real free will. He said, real free will is necessary for us because otherwise why are we responsible for our karma? And the experience of free will which we are having, we say, is not possible if things are predetermined. So I thought I'll share with you some ideas on this important subject. Do we have a real free will or not? The law of karma is based upon our intentions and actions. If we have good intentions and perform good actions, we get good rewards. If we have bad intentions and bad actions, we are punished. This is the whole law of karma. And we have accepted the law of karma in the Indian tradition in all the texts that are known in India, they have accepted that this law of cause and effect is what is creating our life. That past actions of ours are generating our destiny for this life. And they have very clearly defined the karma that it is our past actions, past intentions that have created a destiny for this life which we call our pralabd or fate or destiny for this life. And we have gaps in between the different events that happen in this life and we use our free will to decide what to do. Now while we use our free will, we are also at the same time using our conscience in the mind to determine if what we are doing is good or bad. If we think it's good, we expect a reward and we get it. If we think it's bad, we expect to be punished and we are punished. This is the whole, and this ability to create good and bad by free will, by our actions and intentions, is called the karma and karma. And then we say that in every life we have so much time for having intentions of many kinds, even without following up with action, that we are creating karma way beyond what can be paid off in one lifetime. So the third set of karma is the sinchit karma, the reserve karma, into which all unaccounted for karma goes, which cannot be placed in the next life. This is very simple system. And we account for every event that happens. And it appears that the law of karma has been generally accepted because otherwise we have no justification to say, why are some people born rich? Why are some people born poor? Why are some people flourishing and doing good? Some people are suffering so much. Why is there so much illness in some cases? The death illness in some other cases? The explanation for all these different events that are happening, which look very discriminatory, is the law of karma, that we created it ourselves, that we are responsible for it. Now this law, that it is all our action that is creating this, is challenged by the opposite view that whatever we are doing is predetermined. If it is predetermined, then why are we responsible for it? Whoever predetermined it is responsible. And that is where the issue comes up. Because this gentleman who wrote to me, he is quoting another friend of his, who says he has revelations from his higher self, the highest self. The higher self happens to be our own totality of consciousness beyond time and space. Now you will notice that the karma can only operate in time and space. Karma deals with cause and effect, therefore it deals with events. Events can only take place in time and space. Our higher self is beyond time and space, therefore it cannot have any karma. There is no possibility of events taking place. On the other hand, the will to create anything is still possible even if you have no time and space. 
So when we say at the highest level we have free will, that's correct. That is why sometimes we don't want to call it our own higher self, look too selfish. We give it a different name. We call it God or Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar. We give it a separate name and a separate entity that the creative power is separate and therefore the creative power has all the will. We talk of God's will and our will, God's will and our mind's will. We distinguish between the two. This is actually a name just given to the highest possible level of consciousness where there is only one totality. Now whatever name you want to give it doesn't make a change to the totality of consciousness. And therefore, when we say that the totality of consciousness is expressing its will in the whole of creation, everything has been created from that one single will. And if that happens, that totality happens to be our own self, then we have naturally created our own karma. So it all depends at what level we are talking about. When we are talking at the physical level in which we are sitting right here, in physical bodies, we are totally unaware of how the other levels of consciousness operate. We have no idea at all how they operate. And we have certainly absolutely no idea how we could be operating anything in a timeless state. Our, all our functions here are being engineered, being developed, being acted upon through our mind. The mind can only function in time and space. The mind consists of a, it's a machine that generates thoughts. Every thought takes time. You cannot have a thought without time. Therefore, the mind does not function outside of time and space. So we are living here in time and space and everything we are doing is with the use of our mind. So that is why we cannot even understand our own self. Who are we if we really belong to a state which is beyond time and space? But we can have access to that state. And that is why the mystics come and tell us that we are not what we think we are. We are not our bodies. We are not our sense perceptions. We are not our mind. We are beyond that. We are souls. We are life. We are consciousness. So they use different terms to describe a state of being in which we do not have time and space. And therefore no karma. Karma is generated only for the sake of these experiences we are having here. But who generates it? Who creates the mind? Who creates all these levels? It's the highest level of totality of consciousness. No matter what name you give it, it is still something that is part of our own consciousness. It's not outside of it. Everybody says God is within you. If it is within us, how far does it go within us? Is it part of us? Are we part of it? Or are we it? This discovery can only take place if we can really attain that state. And the mystics tell us we can attain that state. If we can attain the state, then we discover who we really are. If we are able to go to that state in the manner in which the mystics inform us, they tell us that we can discover that there is more of us than the physical body by simple practice of withdrawing our attention from the body and placing it from where we are thinking from where we are experiencing perception, from where we are asking questions, and that is in the center of the head, behind the eyes. If we concentrate our attention and place ourselves there, we are able to gradually become unaware of this physical body. Therefore, we discover that we have another self. Another self that has the same mind, same life, same identity, same self, nothing changes except that we become unaware of the physical body, but we still have all sense perceptions intact. So that is why the difference between that inner self of ours and this self is purely of the physical matter that we are carrying with us. Now if we say we can go beyond that, which we can, 
by withdrawing attention even from our sense perception, even from our imaginative self. We can meditate within the head of our imaginative self. When we imagine we are there, we also have a head like this one. So when we meditate within that, we withdraw ourselves to a state, which very few people have done, but it's possible to do it, that we can discover that we are not even sense perceptions. We don't need to divide perceptions into different senses. That perception is a single act. It's the mind that perceives. And the sense perceptions are merely methods of putting it together so the mind can perceive totality. Total experience is being perceived at one time by the mind and the sense perceptions they are merely a division to create a variety of experiences. Seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, all hearing, these are all divided to give a variety, give a variety of experiences but the perception of the thing as a, as a whole, all these senses combine to give a total perception. And at that state we discover that we have the ability to have total perception without dividing it into different parts like we are doing it now. So that's another experience. It's possible for us to have that experience through simple techniques of meditation, which means withdrawing attention further within our own self. Beyond that, we cannot do anything by our own effort, but we have possibility of going beyond the mind, therefore beyond time and space, beyond what, whatever we are experiencing here, which is a gift, a gift given by somebody who is already there. Who is there? Our own higher self. There is nobody else inside except our own self, but it is not the same self that we are dealing with now. We are dealing with a self that is only accustomed to time and space and here we say inside that is our real self that is giving us life and consciousness, that is making us aware of everything and that self is also nobody else than our own self. It's a more real self than the self we are talking of, which is just using the instruments of the mind, instruments of sense perceptions, instrument of this body. These are just covers upon our true self. So if we can attain that, how? Not by meditation, but by getting pulled inside. Now to be pulled by your own self, inside, you have no idea how to do it. All ideas that we have come from the mind. All methods that we have come from the mind. All technology we have comes from the mind. Everything we do here is from the mind. All effort we make is with the mind. We have no other way to do anything. So the, to say we can use any of these methods to go beyond the mind is totally incorrect because the mind can only do what it can do in time and space. We are talking of discovering our own self beyond time and space. So that is why it is necessary for our higher self, if we call it higher self, for our soul, for our true self, to pull us beyond the mind. And the way to pull is the same way we are pulled here in this physical world, and that is pulled by love. When we feel loved by somebody, we are pulled. When we love somebody, we are pulled. This experience of love that create, is created and we experience all the time here in this physical world, we experience it in other worlds, that pull that comes has to come from within us and our own higher self should pull us. That's the only way that I can figure out that we should be able to get over the area of the mind which is time and space. How do we generate that pull from inside? When the pull comes within us today, right here when we are sitting here, that we want to go beyond that. The pull is coming from within ourselves. We can't see that because we are covered by three big layers, mind, senses, body. We are covered by so many layers of experiences outside so many attachments outside, so many relationships outside, continuously being connected with outside. We are so much outside that we cannot have any idea 
what is pulling us when we want to say we want to go to our true home or go beyond the mind therefore the only thing we can do is to look outside since we are continuously occupied by looking outside now as it is we have to understand what is outside is outside an independent objective reality or is outside merely a reflection of what is inside that's a very big question and that's a big stumbling block for most of us that we cannot accept that what we are seeing outside could be happening inside and we are merely seeing it outside although an explanation can be given very good explanation that what you are seeing outside is only being seen with your sense perceptions and sense perceptions are working through your sense organs and they are all going into your head in the brain where you are experiencing all the five sense perceptions you are experiencing these only inside if the inside can generate if life can generate these experiences inside you will see it exactly like it is outside no difference what is the causal direction of experience is it the existence of outside as an absolute objective reality and we are merely experiencers of that or are we the generators of that experience of inside the simple answer they used to give is that let us see which is the cause which is the effect if the outside is the cause then materialism is correct then material physical world is correct and if inside is the cause then we are making up the whole world that we are seeing outside this issue has been going on for a long time and those who believe that outside is the cause are called the materialists they believe in the actual existence of matter and those who believe that no it's the internal thing that in, from inside we are creating these experiences outside they are called the idealists and they are believing that the ideas in our head are generating experiences outside so when they want to know which is the cause and effect we again apply the same rule of the time what happens first will be the cause what happens later will be the effect now when we start examining are we having a sense perception earlier than the perception we discover there is no time lag at all between the two the experience that we are having of perception sense perception and the actual nature of that experience are identical at the same time of course there is no time lag at all like when we say we look at a tree the looking at the tree is simultaneous with the tree is not separate that is why we cannot determine the cause and effect based upon any time lag between the two they are simultaneous so the matter remains undecided except if we want to examine what is inside us then of course we can find a different answer when we withdraw our attention within ourselves and see how the mind functions at the causal plane then we come to the conclusion that yes the idealist were right because everything we have seen outside pre existed inside not only existed pre existed inside in time and space so that is why we manufactured our destinies inside ourselves now whose will was it that generated that particular pattern of creation the will obviously was also inside not outside so since we do not know how to look beyond the mind inside we look outside but if this world is really created subjectively like i am suggesting and this has been proven by those who have gone inside and seen that the world that we see outside was generated from inside it's merely a reflection of what is inside us hard to believe but if you test out from actual experience you discover that the reality that the world outside we are experiencing is being generated from inside in our consciousness then we can say okay if that is so then if the inside and the outside are the same then maybe we can see something outside to find something inside 
Is the inside and outside are the same? Why should we go inside to see what is outside? We can see outside what is inside. If we generate this experience outside, would we not generate an experience of our own self also being outside? If the power of consciousness is as wide and as unlimited as we believe it is, then obviously the power of consciousness can generate an experience outside which will represent our own higher insight. And that is exactly what happens. The pull that we are feeling from inside, we begin to feel the same pull outside with an individual who comes into our life, who looks like something different, but actually represents our own self. When we talk of an individual and call him a perfect living master, who is that individual? Why has he appeared in our life? Why at a particular time? What is the connection <clears throat> between the experience of having that such an individual and the timing of our own search for who we are? How has this coincidence happened? If we look at these facts, we will notice that this is something that we have arranged ourselves. We have arranged, obviously, as totality of consciousness, as the ultimate. We have arranged that when we have these experiences, a series of experiences, starting from individuation, one totality has become many. That's the first step. It may be just a concept, but you try to see how this concept works, that we are one. Not the number one, total. That there is nothing outside of it. If we are that which is total, then that's our reality. And then we create the many. Where do we create? In the one. There is no time space there to go outside anywhere. It's within the one. So the many are created in the one. That is how we describe the ultimate creative power as the souls within that power. And I often give an example. One glass of water has millions of drops in it. I can make them billions by making them smaller. I can make them trillions by making them still smaller. The souls are merely within the one and are units of consciousness because the one is totality of consciousness. The ability. What is consciousness? The ability to be conscious of anything. It's that potential that you can be conscious of anything which becomes creation. If you become conscious and become aware of something, it becomes creation. If the one has many in it, then they become souls. Not separated. We are not destroying that one at any time at all. We are not leaving that one at, at any time at all. If we leave, it will never remain total. Therefore, the whole show is taking place in the one. And the show starts by within the one, the many come up. And why should we have many? Is it one enough? One has certain qualities, certain features, certain descriptions, which we use even here. We say, God is love. I would say, let me retranslate, totality of consciousness is love. It's not a lover, because they don't want to love. It is not a beloved, nobody loves it. How does love become a lover and a beloved? By simple act of making the one into the many. So the creation of a soul is purely so that the knowledge, awareness, total awareness available to the one becomes a reality as an experience. Not experience in time, but an experience outside of time. That the one can enjoy the experiences of that bliss 
totality, whatever the total is, whichever of true home is defined as. Now, when it happens, then we add on to that experience of the one with the many in it, and we add on something which can be easily created by consciousness called the human mind. Human mind is nothing but a process by which we can generate thoughts, and therefore to generate thoughts, we create time and space, all happening within the total still. Nothing will ever happen outside of the total. Total remains as it is. When the mind is added to the soul, the soul begins to experience vastness in time and in space. The vastness is so huge, it's unlimited. That is why they say that when this step is taken, the causal plane generates an infinite amount of time and space, which cannot be measured. In that time and space, now we can place events. That's the beauty of time and space, that now the experiences that we have can be generated as events. And the events can be linked to each other by cause and effect. That's where the law of karma is born, very simply. The whole show is being created within that one. When we go further, we can divide the perception of the events on the timeline with different sense perceptions. We separate seeing from hearing, seeing from touching. We separate these and begin to have an experience much wider for the same purpose. The total awareness, total knowledge, total bliss, total joy, total happiness, all that is now being made into an experience through events. And the events are then made into high and low to increase the experience, the value of the experience. Then we add on matter to make a physical body. Then we make different forms of life. It's such a beautiful game to, to look at the whole of creation that how beautifully it has been designed. There is reference to some of this in a, in a book called Anurag Sagar, The Ocean of Love by Kabir. Kabir the saint tried to describe it. It's a dialogue between Kabir and his principal disciple, Dharam Das. And he is trying to tell him that what is beyond time space cannot be described. Therefore, he says, I'll make it a story. So we can understand stories better than we can understand something that is beyond our description. So he says, let's say that oneness, that totality was a person. Let's say true person. Sat Purush, let's say true person. And he had many children. Children were merely qualities. The top child, the first one, describes as patience. Sahaj. Patience, and the fifth one was passion. To give the all the list of possible <coughs> qualities that we can have in conscious experiences and divide them into 16 experiences and add them and say they were the children. And the first child was patience, the fifth was passion, the fifth was a very naughty boy, and he is the one that created all this here. That this game has been going on from the fifth child, the passion onwards, who created all the law of karma and space and time. And so the story is very interesting. Some of you have read it, and others I am recommending. You might like to read how in the form of a story he is describing the creation. But the point I am making is, he is saying that our return back to our true home is by creating the right conditions outside of ourselves. So a perfect living master is not really a separate being. He is acting as a separate being here to represent that which pulls us from inside, which is our own self. Because at that level, there is only one. Now, how does he represent? How can a person, or individual, and another human being, I represent our higher self because in his consciousness 
he has attained the level of that oneness, which each one of us can attain. That's our reality. So he appears in our life as a separate human being, and we do not at that time realize that this is our own pull from inside that is generating an experience of an individual coming into our life and pulling us. But what does the individual say? The individual who represents our higher self does not say, come to me, I will give you something here, come to that mountain top, I'll give you something here, come, I'll give you some real knowledge if you come here. He says, go within yourself. If he is, why is he suggesting that go within yourself? He keeps on saying, go within yourself, meditate and go within yourself. After we have met him, after we have become friends of that individual, he says, go within yourself. Keeps on repeating. And we try, but it's very hard to go within. He keeps on repeating. That meditation is to go within yourself. Why? When we go within ourselves, accompanied with the love that we are feeling for that person by the pull he's creating, we find that we remember him inside too. When we remember him inside, he appears as if he's also there. Every stage we go inside, we find he's there. Why is that? Because he is merely representing our own self, not somebody else. That is why he's saying, go further within yourself. The more we go within ourselves, the more he takes us to the same oneness, where there is no difference between that person outside and ourselves. We talk of merger in the totality. It's a simple game that our totality has generated experiences for us. It is our own self, our true self. Our true self is one. It's not two. It's always been one. That one true self of ours has separated itself into so many for the sake of experience. We are now billions of people sitting here on this planet and there may be billions sitting in other planets and the manyness has ex expanded as far as it could. The manyness is this responsible for our experiences. If we don't have many, we won't have experiences. That is why the many has expanded over and over again so that we enlarge our experience. We have a beautiful, wonderful experience of creation. What is creation? Whatever the consciousness can be conscious of is creation. And that is why the whole of creation is taking place on that basis. And we have great dramatic experiences, high and low, good and bad. We have generated every possible kind of experiences, not only in one form of life, in several forms. In physical form, we have 8.4 million types of forms that exist in the physical and astral self. So you will be surprised that the power of consciousness has generated so much experience. Of course, the human experience is the most valuable out of all. Now I come back to the very same subject I started. Why is it the most valuable experience? Because when we are human beings, we are ignorant of the future. We do not know what will happen next day. We can surmise, we can guess, but it may not happen that way. And therefore, we make decisions on what we can do or not do, which gives us the experience of free will, that we have the power to decide what we will do. Nobody can interfere. Somebody says, oh, you are destined to go right, right, we'll go left. We can change destiny. Anybody, any astrologer comes and tells me something, I'll defy it. So therefore, the experience of our decision making, the experience that we can decide what to do, is absolutely real. Nobody can deny that we have that experience right here. Therefore, if we are only talking of the experience of free will, you cannot say it's not real. It is real. 
we experience it every day. We can't even avoid it. Somebody says, you don't have free will or you have free will. He's giving an answer purely out of free will. Even a person who says, I have no free will, is using his free will to say that. That is why free will is a reality. And we are experiencing it. So, we can't deny it. But then, there are people who can foretell. They can say, this will happen next week. And it happens. Sometimes we can see something that is going to happen in our dreams. How can we know in advance? If the free will is totally real, then we cannot know anything in advance of what is going to happen because we will decide it. We have to decide today what will happen tomorrow. Then if the decision making is to be made today, how can anybody predict anything about the future? They are not only astrologers who are doing it. There have been people who could... There was a lady I met many years ago and she was able to see in a dream something happening a week later. She used to record it in a journal and everything she recorded happened a week later including a meeting with me that she had recorded, which happened. So, how can people see something happening in the future if it is not already there? So, this is a big clash. If something is already there, it's predetermined that we will go through that. So how do we find out whether what is our own decision making is predetermined or not? There is no way that we can find it sitting in the physical plane. It's not possible because we are totally ignorant of the future. These are just sparks of information that we get here and now, now and then, which create a doubt on our determination or predetermination of what is going to happen. But if we meditate and go to a different level of awareness, we find some answers. Because at a certain level of awareness, we discover that we can see the whole future. We can see what decisions we are going to make. Now that's amazing that we are making decisions now. How can somebody say that these are decisions you will make? Because we discover that what is predetermined is not the events we are talking of. What is predetermined is how we will make a decision in a particular situation. We can go to two steps above this level of awareness. First step, which we call the astral self or the self where sensory perceptions come and we can see events. That the events will happen. And we challenge those events. We challenge them there. Then we go one step higher, which we call the causal plane, or where we see the functioning of the mind, and we discover that the functioning of the mind, how it will function in different events that are placed there, that is predetermined. How we will reason in our mind and make a decision, that is predetermined. It's not the event. It's the reasoning in our head that is predetermined and pre-scripted. By who? Ourself. So that is why they say that if you say, do you have free will? If we scripted it, of course it's our free will. But here we didn't know it. Because here we, are, we have shut off that experience of our own internal working of the mind. We have shut off the experience of our own sensory system working inside. We are just caught up in the physical world here. Therefore, the experience is absolutely real here. When we go up, it becomes unreal because we can see how we programmed it. We are completely programmed, 100%, not somewhere. Then the strange things happen. We have a problem here in the physical plane and we go to a perfect master or we go to any guru or we go to an enlightened person. Please, can you give us some divine help? Our karma is very bad. We are suffering. Can you please help? 
he says, okay, I give you my blessings and we get help. We say, this man changed our karma. This man changed what was predestined. Obviously, whatever our life was, he was able to change it. Therefore, nothing is predetermined. A divine intervention can change everything. And then we go in meditation and we find what is recorded there that we will get divine intervention and feel it's a change. Predetermined. Every level we go higher up, we discover what looks like an intervention and change was predetermined at a higher level. Where is the ultimate determination? Ultimate determination is at the level of totality of one. Where we are all one. Therefore, if you want to say, do we have real free will? If we are there, yes. If we are not there, no. If we are not there, we are experiencing what we are experiencing here. Therefore, we are devoid of the awareness of our own programming of our lives here. We sometimes want to blame somebody else. The blame game is very easy at the state at which we are now. Why did God give us bad karma? Where is God giving bad karma? Sitting inside. Who is God? Our own higher self. And we gave it to ourselves. So the whole game is so strange that when we say, do we have free will? If you're talking of some other level, yes, you have. If you're talking of here, no, we don't because we determined. But do you experience free will? Certainly you do at each level. You experience free will because of the lack of knowledge of what is already predetermined. But what is the value of it? If predetermination was done by us for an experience, which is what life is, what we have come at all levels of creation, at all levels of consciousness, was merely a desire to enlarge our experience, a desire to make our own qualities into experiences. And they have been generated for centuries, for limitless time. And we have been enjoying them or suffering them. Enjoying and suffering at the same time. Because that's what we wanted. We wanted that the experiences generated should be in such a way that we did not have in our totality. As I mentioned, love is not an experience in totality. It becomes an experience in the many. It becomes an experience here. We generated experiences at different levels of consciousness. And in doing so, we generated huge universes. We generated so many creations and worlds around us and experienced them and enjoyed them. And they have yet made an arrangement that when we are tired of all this, when we have had enough, we should be able to go back to our state. Where there is no division of experiences, where there is no high and low, where there are no opposites. In our own state of oneness, there can be no opposite. There can be no duality. It's non-dual. And yet, we created an opposite of it by creating experiences of duality. It was very important to create the experience of duality to make even our non-dual experience as an opposite of the experience of duality. It's amazing how it has been done that where we are totally non-dual, there is nothing opposite, that we can generate an experience which is the opposite because it is dual. The duality is merely an opposite of the non-duality. So we created a duality, even a non-duality, by producing a world and experiences of pairs of opposites. That is the importance of the experiences here. They have to be placed in non-duality so that they can become an opposite of the non-duality we have. So the experiences here in all these levels from the mind below are in pairs of opposites. You can't have an experience unless there's an opposite of it. In every way. 
You cannot have light without darkness. You cannot have happiness without unhappiness. You cannot have pleasure without pain. You cannot have anything without the opposite. If you take one away, the other goes away by itself. That is why even in the material sciences, they are finding out the positive and negative charges, and electrons and positrons. If you take one away, matter, anti-matter, if you take one away, the other disappears. They are created in pairs of opposites. Every experience has been generated in pairs of opposites so that the pairs of opposites create a dual world, a world of duality. And our original state is non-duality, thereby creating an opposite of that state also. It's a beautiful way of doing it. I can't imagine anything more perfect than the way this universe has been set up, that the creation has been set up. And here we are. Imagine what I'm sharing with you is the possibility in a human being to have the experiences of all these levels of consciousness in one body, in one human body, in such a small little body, in a grand universe created around it. We can have the experiences of every level of consciousness, not possible in any other form of life on the physical level. Not possible in any other form, not even the form of angels, not in the form of gods creating the universes. In no other form can you have the experience. Why? Because no other form has the power to discuss in the head and to have an argument in the head, should I do it or not do it? The experience of free will. This experience of free will is a secret for seeking. If you did not have this experience of free will as a reality here, you could not seek. You could not find anything. That is why the value of this wonderful secret that being not real, not absolute, is still an experience, a useful experience, tied up without seeking, tied up without discovery of our own self. It's the seeking that makes us go within our own self. It's the seeking that brings that human being in our life, whom we call a perfect living master, an arrangement we have made to discover our own totality. It's a wonderful system. So that is why I feel so happy when I share these things with you, because I find that I was very lucky, very fortunate to find this gentleman with the white beard, this white bearded gentleman, Baba Savan Singh, great master. He was that person who represented the totality of consciousness in a human body. Perfect living masters have always been there for any seeker who wants to go back home. It's not a unique thing. I felt it was unique. I felt I am the only one, lucky one, who found such a one. Till I could discover that the seeker in all of us, all the creation has seekers. And wherever they seek, perfect living masters appear. That's the part of the game, part of the show. That when you are tired of this show that is going on, when you're tired of coming again and again, to the same drama again and again, you have an opportunity to go back home. What do you need to do? Seek within yourself. When you seek within yourself and you can't find anything inside, a perfect living master appears outside and looks like outside and he takes you inside. And ultimately you find that the person that you're seeing outside was no other than your own higher self. It's not somebody else who is coming outside. You have pulled yourself in by the presence of somebody you generated in your experiences outside. It's the most beautiful way this, this whole universe has been generated. And the truth of it can be verified by us by going inside. No other way. It's not a matter of argument. It's not a matter of debate. You can keep on debating all your life sitting here outside. The outside will not give you answers about the inside. Going inside will give you the answers about the inside. That is why it is nice to hear things 
and feel some connection with that. It's nice to feel resonance in that, that you resonate with what you hear. But the truth is, for a mind to be satisfied, you have to go inside. Our mind will always create doubts. That's its function. The mind has been given to us as a very useful tool for many reasons. The main reason we have a mind is that we are able to generate time and space by thinking. And the thoughts generate that, and thoughts generate events then. But also the mind has been given the power to create doubt and fear. Doubt because otherwise we are, we are vulnerable to accepting everything anybody says. Skepticism is necessary on a spiritual path. If you are just a blind follower of anything, you will find nothing. You have to screen, you have to find out the difference between what looks like the truth and what is not the truth. Therefore, the mind has been given the skepticism so that you have a doubt and resolve your doubt. Doubts have to be resolved in order to really make progress on the spiritual path. If you have doubts and you say, I am going to bypass my doubts and move on on blind faith, you end up nowhere. The doubts never leave you. They pull you back at any time. So many people say we over, overlook our doubts and we are just moving on blind faith, we believe in somebody. Then what happens? One shocking event takes place in their life and the whole faith goes away. Blind faith is not a reliable thing at all. People are having blind faith because of religion. Religion is creating blind faith in us. It wasn't supposed to be like that. If you look at the founders of religions, they didn't say what religions are saying today. The religions are drawing us into outside ceremonies, outside rituals, what you have to do outside. That's what religion has become. And nobody is telling us how to go within, which is the secret of all religions. All founders talked about going within our own self and finding. And we are now being led into an outside ceremonial system, outside rituals being performed, and we call it religion. So religion is creating something different from what spirituality was supposed to be. The founders talked of spiritual things. And we made them into religions. Spirituality is not a religion. Spirituality is to discover your spirit, your soul. Discover who you really are. All religions are saying the same thing. They discover who you are, discover the truth, discover the creative power within you. But yet, they are telling you to do things outside. Go inside. The truth is all inside. I am very happy to have this opportunity to share these things with you and they are based upon my experience with my perfect living master and I don't, I'm not, I'm not sharing things from the books or anything, I'm sharing things from my experience with my master and it is his blessings that is helping me to share these things. Without his blessings I could not utter a word I can tell you. All these words, take it there, they are like coming from the perfect living master, great master, Baba Saman Singh. So happy to see all of you. I feel very happy when I see fellow travelers, co-travelers with me on the same spiritual path, heading for the same true home where we are all one. When you are having that kind of awareness, even the thought of that awareness makes you love everybody. This is be it's beautiful when we know that all of us are created from the same oneness. How can you hate anybody? How can you dislike anybody? They are all part of yourself. They are part of your own to total self. That is why your whole attitude changes and love flows automatically. Then you realize that's all part of the same one. That is why in, in the, the Indian scripture, one of the scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib says that everything is being generated from the same source. Manda kisano vakhiye je koi dujja hoi. How can I call anybody bad if there's nobody else? It's only one. That is why when you have that awareness, even the thought of the awareness helps us that if we are all one, 
How can you hate anybody? They are all part of the same. And if they are part of totality, they are part of God. They are part of the creative power. You would love everybody for that. Once this awareness comes, you will see that love is automatic. It doesn't have to be developed anyway. It's just a knowledge, it's awareness that brings about the love for everybody. I am so happy to see all of you and all my master's blessings be with you. I'll take a break now and I'll come back for a little while later about 3.30.